when I considered who to be our keynote commencement speaker, I looked for someone who is a role model for the type of leaders we aspire to help to develop at Ross. A person who not only had a successful career, but who also had a positive and profound impact in our society. Richard Louis, Louis embodies these qualities. His career has been highly successful and varied as those of many of our graduates are likely to be. Richard worked in Fortune 500 companies and founded a tech startup. As a journalist, he covered breaking news as well as issues related to gender equity, affordable housing, and human trafficking. He also is engaged with highly impactful volunteer work on issues ranging from food insecurity to epilepsy. He's now an anchor on NBC and MSNBC. His on-the-ground reporting on civil rights, especially for the Asian American community, have earned him several prestigious awards. He has brought many stories to our attention that have significantly impacted our world and has directed two documentaries, the second of which, Unconditional, is set to release next month. And he's written two books, the second of which will be published next year. Richard is a proud MBA alumnus and a tireless, ambas a tireless ambassador and advocate for Michigan Ross. Not sure when he ever sleeps. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Well, thank you, Dean Sharon. Uh, your first year as our fearless leader, and I got to say of the conversations we've had, both formal and informal, we are so glad to have you. All of the alumni, all of the students, big round of applause for our Dean Sharon. Well, good afternoon, Michigan Ross. How are you? Yeah. It is so great to be back home. They're gonna have to pry me away from Ann Arbor as I finish out this conversation. Well, graduates, proud moms, worried dads, friends, tired faculty and staff, you have made it. And to the grads, this is a day like no other in your lives and here you are. Your eyes wide, your hopes high, your blood alcohol level through the roof. <laughs> yes, you certainly remind me of past me. So I asked myself, if future me would like to give past me a piece of advice, what would that be? After all my years writing headlines, I'd have to say it would be, don't live for the headlines. Don't live for the hashtags, the memes, and certainly not the slogans. I mean, let me give you an example. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. We've all heard that one. But how crazy is that? If we only did what felt right, we'd never leave the hotel jacuzzi. We'd never eat vegetables and have a diet of wings and jello shots, only one dollar during happy hour at the brown jug from 7 to 10 p.m. daily. <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, we wouldn't go to the doctors. After all, giving blood does not feel very right, right? I don't know about you, but I like to keep blood inside my body. So why give blood? If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. That slogan, well, it just doesn't feel right. Another slogan to poke at with our intellectual finger, uh, mistakes lead to the best things in life. Mistakes lead to the best things in life. That's probably what uh, OSU grads will be saying at their commencement next week. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> but really, mistakes leading to the best things? So let's climb a treeless mountain during a lightning storm then, right? What's the worst mistake that can happen from that? The truth is mistakes do not lead to the best things in life. As you know, it's the hard fought lessons we learn many times from mistakes that lead us to the best things in life. But the crowd never adds those caveats, as you know, so these oversimplified memes like mistakes lead to the best things in life, they get liked, shared, or turned into an inspirational Instagram post left and right. 
The problem is these misleading slogans sooner or later become what we think we must live by. And we'll do anything to stay on slogan, stay on message, do anything to stay on brand. That is the tension. We have so many voices telling us about what is is and what success is and what happiness is. But what about our voice? One of the slogans we see reinforced day after day that we can and should have everything. You're the new leaders. You have everything. And if you don't have everything, then you are not successful, not happy, and you'll be alone forever. No pressure. We all battle slogans unknowingly, and I've certainly battled them too. Not too long ago, it seemed like everything was humming along in my career. I covered and broke major stories, had shows on CNN and MSNBC, interviewed a president or two and read the teleprompter. Eh. But then life went off script. My father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I had everything, and it was now going to come crashing down, it appeared to me. And as that disease progressed, I knew I wanted to work less so that I could help care for my dad, except he was across the country. So what I did is one day, I took a deep breath, and I walked into my boss's office. I thought it was to have that conversation that would end my career forever. There are no part-time field journalists or anchors, after all. I sat down with my boss, Yvette Miley. I said, you know, my father is not very well. I told her, I think I may need to spend more time flying back to California. Yvette sat up in her chair, looked at me as though she was going to say, sorry to see you go. We'll see what we can do when you can return. She said this instead, Richard, I also care for my mom in Florida. And let's think of some ideas to make this work for you. And so began a three-day work week. I'd anchor on the weekend and then fly back home to San Francisco to care for my dad and back and forth. But the compromise meant I was leaving the front bench. I'd no longer be asked to go on location for breaking news and my paycheck was certainly slashed. I thought, I was trading a life that I had invested years to get to, giving it up for my dad who may not even know what I was doing. And surprisingly, while caring for my father during that time, I started openly sharing with others, other caregivers, and volunteering with community groups to share my physical and mental health journey. I opened up in ways I never thought I would, even getting approval for an employee group of caregivers at 30 Rock. And in the end, choosing not to have everything, that actually gave me more. It helped me choose what I really valued. And it opened the door to do things I thought I'd never do. And if this is not having everything, everything's gonna be okay. Now, sitting next to the slogan about having everything is that slogan of, hey, you can go everywhere. You've heard it. The sky's the limit. The world is our oyster to infinity and beyond. Buzz Lightyear, 1995. But what if we cannot go everywhere? What if we don't like oysters? Well, 2020 was the beginning, as was just said by Oral of more than four billion people required to stay home, and you all were part of that. I used to fly 300,000 miles a year. I was everywhere. It was a badge of pride. I knew the best seats in just about every lounge in the country. Just ask me. Now the only seat I knew was in my shrinking New York apartment. At work, I was... Um, one of those designated survivors. Uh, three times a week, I got into one of the few plastic-wrapped cars on the road to go into NBCHQ. Streets that once held eight million people 
each day were empty each day, except me and the ambulances on 10th Avenue rushing toward the unknown. Among my duties to be there in case my fellow anchors and correspondents were out with the virus or signals went down. We had a so-called clean floor, an entire floor at 30 Rock. Uh, we sealed it off so if the world around us faltered, we could theoretically still be safe and broadcast. As a journalist, I never felt more isolated, yet at the same time, driven to do my job even better. Mutations, super scientists, testing sites, racial upheaval. It was an honor to get the news out. But I couldn't visit my dad during that time as he got worse. I sat alone in New York as he went in and out of the hospital in California. He was alone, nobody to protect and defend him. I knew he was scared. So sitting in my apartment those months, I found parts of myself I thought I had lost. I had wanted to write a book about caring for other people. I like light topics, clearly. Now is a good time. So I sat by the window for months and tried to finish it. Even if I couldn't be with my dad to help him, I could pass along the values that he taught me to others, potentially. We all relearned that being with family is a gift, right? The virus took that from us in so many different ways. Being with the ones we love, who love us and who raised us, may not feel like flying to the moon or trekking to the most distant places on earth, but they are the places we cannot replace. There is only one home, there's only one family, that is our everywhere, and we can get there by not moving at all. These slogans of doing everything, of going everywhere, you know, I realized they meant something different than what the advertising was, right? Just as I realized in my job, breaking news is not always so urgent. It's not always urgent news, but we call it breaking. Do we need to have all the details now, immediately, and all at once? Well, that was my third question. You know, business can be just as urgent. The time value of money, speed to market, customer demand, all are ingrained in the velocity of our Fortune 500 and startup culture. Same day delivery, on demand content, front door, anything and everything. It rules our lives. No waiting, not even for half a second. I know the feeling. After launching a startup out of this great school, Ross, I wrote out this plan 10 steps to becoming a news anchor for a U.S. network in just two years. Of course, I'd be a respected anchor and wealthy in just two years, right? Because my plan said so. Well, life had a different plan. It took five years to get that first job, and I am certainly still working on the respected and wealthy part. Um, for me, certainly it has not come yet. It has not come all at once. And high school was part of that. I didn't want to go to college, and frankly, we could not afford it. So I worked at cookie stores for Mrs. Fields for five years. And there, I actually thought I had it all. I mean, I was 20 years old, and I sold the most cookies of any store in the country, over 2,500 cookies each day. I was the Keebler Elves' worst nightmare. I'm trying. Then I was fired, and it turns out my job, like the chocolate I sold, was kind of semi-sweet. Selling cookies was not my passion after all, so I went about my life. I enrolled at a community college and worked part-time. I was doing the everyday things that I really thought I cared about. Things for me, it seemed, that needed to come deliberately, step by step, before I could get there. And then I heard about Jonathan. His journey was somehow about all of our journeys. Jonathan was just like most kids in middle school. 
But then his mother brought him to tag along for his brother's movie audition. His brother didn't get the role, but they saw Jonathan, and they kind of liked Jonathan. They gave him the offer. Twelve years old, and Jonathan found his passion, and it turned out to be a breakout role that led to two blockbuster films with him in it. Everybody knew Jonathan. You know, he was a, he was a superstar. It seemed he had it all. But after his early films where he played a boy from China, he grew into a teen and young adult, and things changed. He couldn't get a job in Hollywood, audition after audition, but no roles for him, then no auditions, and no calls. His agent saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing, but I, I'll call you. Sitting by the phone, waiting at home for it to ring, the movie business had passed Jonathan by. But he still had the passion. So Jonathan started to work behind the scenes, boom operator, gaffer, production assistant, anything to pursue this joy that he had. He said he felt unseen by the industry that he loved so much. It was that way for him for more than 20 years. And then this year, for his first role after two decades, Jonathan was not Jonathan anymore. You see, he took the stage and the stage name, Jonathan, when he couldn't get jobs. It was more American, more marketable. But not this time. Ki Hui Kwan had grown from his days as short round in the Indiana Jones films. And this time, this year, he wanted to be himself all at once. Not as Jonathan, but as Ki Hui Kwan at the Oscars. So when he raised that golden statue as best supporting actor after his hard work behind the camera, he finally had it all at once. His name was more known than ever. His career was hotter than ever, all from the acclaimed movie called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. As all of you leave today, you will pack your suitcase You'll fill it with plans of journeys, trips with friends, promises of careers, and you'll take your suitcase to a water project in Uganda. You'll take it consulting in Chicago. You'll take it to spend time with grandpa as he battles sickness. This is your suitcase for your journey. Along with what others give you, pack what is you? Put in that suitcase what brought you and proudly carry that suitcase every place your journey takes you. You know, we are challenged to be lots of things, to live lots of slogans, to do everything, to be everywhere, to have it all at once. Like Ki Hui Kwan, Please write your own slogans and live your own everything, everywhere, all at once. Go Blue!